parts made watertight, and you can see the sewage coming out. Um, and that just shows the power of the ability to dilute and, and diffuse the sewage. So let's take a look at a video from a calling point. So here's the ROV traveling the pipe. You can see the fish swimming around. And instead of having those horns that come out of the clover point style diffusers, these are just basically holes that have been punched in the side of the pipe. Once again, the vinegar suit coming out. Fish don't seem to mind. Um, there are a lot of toxins coming out that are getting diluted and things that are heavy are settling to the bottom and they're building up in the sediment down there. And that's where largely the contamination exists in the system, in the sediment around the outfall. It's about the size of a football field on each one. And the rest of it is just simply diluted to parts per billion and parts per trillion to the point where we can't actually detect these things. So I found another video on YouTube that I thought would be interesting to illustrate what it's like just beyond the outfalls. And this was taken by a diver. He went down to Clover Point and uh, just hopped in the water. And what we can see here is what the real impact is of the sewage treatment system. We get a lot of complaints from the Americans that were polluting the system. We get a lot of concern here, environmental groups and so forth. But I don't think anyone's really seen this. This is exactly what's happening out of the outfalls. So this is closer to shore, of course, and it's, uh, you can see the light coming in. Um, that I'm just moving around. But there's plenty of life there. It's really quite interesting. Seemingly out there, quite a sewage. So there's lots of activity there. So when we hear that it's polluting, I mean, there is pollution going out, and we're using water to dilute that pollution. But largely, it seems OK. But a lot of pollutants are, are ones that we cannot see. They're invisible pollutants, or they're hard to measure. And that is really at the core of the issue with sewage treatment. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the problem? Why are we building a sewage treatment system? If it looks like that, and the outfalls are effective, why are we doing it? So CRD has put together a little ad as part of this consultation process, and I found that on YouTube as well. And I brought that along, and I'll give you a bit of an explanation of what the issue is here. We haven't really seen any of the meat, any of the real details. We haven't seen the technology. We've largely seen maps with circles and lines on them. Not much detail. But the interesting um, th thing that they're showing there are all of the, the uses of shower, the drains, and all those things. Everything that goes down the drain goes out of the sewage system. And we've been relying on the dilution system for a long time to get rid of these things. But there are now things that are going into the system that are having an impact on the marine life. And we can't see that in the video because it's they're invisible and it's small. But I'm going to try to illustrate that. So it was first brought to my attention by, um, by uh, actually it was Andrew Wheatley, uh, the MLA for Hope Bay Gordon Head, that there had been a study done in the Great Lakes about microplastics building up in the lakes. And when we uh, wash our clothes, microfibers go down the drain, you know, right off this. Or if we uh, use personal care products and things, there are little pieces of plastic in them. 
And many parts of the world are banning these products, but I don't think it's good enough to just try to deal with it at the source, because the industry is very good at leading the regulations and putting things into products long before the regulations catch up with them and require that we take them out. So one of the classic products um, are these facial scrubs. And you can see in the uh, ingredients at the bottom, or in the description, it says microbeads, gently exfoliate, cleans deep in the pores for soft and smooth skin. Sounds good. And you look on the back of the package, and it actually says polyethylene, plastic. And plastic doesn't break down in the ocean. It doesn't break down in the landfills. And it certainly doesn't break down in the animals that ingest them. On the left of this photo is, uh, is what these what this particular polypropylene plastic looks like. It's not clear looking, it's got kind of a, a white color to it because I guess it's been mixed with the facial scrub. And on the right are grains of sand, and um, just to give you an idea of how big these things are. But they do come in many sizes and they do fragment and they break up into smaller pieces. So there's a publication called the Marine Pollution Bulletin uh, that's put out regularly, and uh, they wrote this. Once used by the consumer, the plastic microbeads may be washed down the drain but few of any wastewater treatment facilities capture all floating, non-biodegradable particulate of half a millimeter size or smaller. Also, during high rain events, some municipalities which have combined sewer systems may experience combined sewage overflow events, allowing raw sewage to enter local untreated waterways. And this was alluded to earlier when we were, I think it was, uh, I think it was Oscar talking about the overflows. And so, where there are single sewage systems, like we have in Uplands, where there's essentially one pipe connecting the outside of the house, the rain gutters, and the inside of the house with all the drains, compared to our homes here, which have the two separate systems, um, and other places where there's limited capacity of pipes, when the rains are heavy, it overflows from one system into the other, and ends up going out to short outfalls on the beaches and many other places. So it's not just at the end of the system. You have to actually fix the system properly all over to make it work properly. But there's a cost to do that. And we have to, um, I think, receive full some information and cost in order to make a good decision. And I think where the case is warranted, ask our partners at the federal provincial government to help fund those repairs. Because it's very difficult for us to do them on our own. And many of these things were built with, with funding. So another person I was introduced by Dr. Andrew Weaver was Dr. Peter Ross. And, uh, Dr. Ross used to work at the Institute of Ocean Sciences up at uh, Patricia Bay at the federal facility there. And uh, he was downsized by the federal government, previous government. And he has a job now at the Vancouver Aquarium. And I think he's quite happy there. Um, and he was co author of uh, a microplastics report that was very similar to the one that was done in the Great Lakes the widespread distribution of microplastics in subsurface seawater in the North East Pacific Ocean. What they wrote was disposal of municipal wastewater contaminated with fibers from washing clothes was a major source of plastic fibers. Vancouver, Victoria, and Seattle are major urban centers that release their wastewater inflow into the Strait of Georgia, Juan de Fuca Strait, and Puget Sound, providing a putative source of microplastics to this coastal region on the British Columbia and Washington state boundary. And what they did is they went out on a boat, sampled the water, and then they sorted the plastics that they found, the microfibers that they found, and they did a count. Plastics of this size, plastics of this size, plastics of this size. And they counted how many there were in a cubic meter of water, meter by one meter by one meter. And they produced this graph that shows near the population centers, where you can see uh, where the blues and the green are, there's a greater number of microplastics than there are in the purple areas farther out to sea. And it's not very good at the top of the island there. And largely, this is coming from man-made sources. And largely, it's coming from the sewage treatment system. If you have uh, some plastic and you throw it out in the ocean, of course, that's one source of it. But a lot of this is coming from our sewage treatment system. It's coming from the sinks, drains, washing machines, and so forth. So what's the big problem? The problem is uh, what's called the bioaccumulation of contaminants, the uptake through the food chain the small animals and organisms that eat these things, that are eaten by other things and other things, and bigger fish and bigger fish, until we end up eating that fish. So plankton are at the bottom of the food chain, and uh, what they've done in this dish is they put a fluorescent
parts that die of the microplastics and they put them into the dish. And they're showing how these plankton that are filter feeders are ingesting the plastics and microfibers. And they're going into their digestive systems and they're staying there. So what we have is a, an invisible danger. We, have, we can't see it with the camera that the diver has going down in the ocean. It all looks beautiful. But this is what's going out, and we need technology to capture this. So I think there's different ways of dealing with it. We can put a filter on everyone's washing machine, we have a sink, and all these kinds of things. But how do we maintain that? How do we guarantee that? It's, I think it's better to deal with it in a place where you can catch the problem and do it right. We shouldn't be putting things down in the sink. We can, provide education to do that, but largely these things get into products and we find out a long time afterwards that they're harmful. And I think that's just been the, the case of history and of, and of industry. So let's go back to the diagrams before and look at the options that the CRD has presented so far. And we've seen this uh, in some of the earlier slides. And, and we don't have much of an idea of what's being done today. It's largely circles and, and lines um, indicating a discharge strategy. where. The sewage is going to be treated and where it's going to be discharged. And the discharge at this point is Clover Point, and the treatment is going to be a rock bank. And this is the one plant option. CRD is trying to expand this to include a two plant option. You can see there's one open call with this little blue circle now. Here's a four plant option. They put something in sandwich and they put something over at First Nations land over in Squamont. And a seven plant option. And this is getting towards what is called a, a distributed system. And the difference between distributed and decentralized is a distributed system is all connected together by pipes. Where a decentralized system are a system of independent plants that you saw in some of the slides earlier. And what we know, without a doubt, is the more plants and pipes you have, the more expensive it gets. And so really all we have is a more expensive option followed by an even more expensive option, which we, followed by an even more expensive option. And we're trying to figure out the literature that's been handed out which of these is the best? Which one provides the best overall option for us in terms of resource recovery, saving the water, dealing with the solids in an efficient way, and so forth? So the cost so far, and I call this sewage 2.0, the Glockman project that failed called sewage 1.0. And uh, the documentation that the CRD has provided to the residents um, has shown two costs. And what we see in the newspaper reported is a billion dollars is actually a little bit more because the plan that's being put forth actually requires an upgrade in 2030. So if the plan gets built at the end of 2020, as the federal regulations require, there's going to be a required upgrade in 2030, and these are the costs. So we start with a billion dollars for the one plan, but in 2030, only 10 years later, we have to add another $253 million. And that isn't part of the funding formula at the moment. We'll have to go back to those levels of government to ask for more funding, or we'll have to pay that cost ourselves. And it just gets more and more expensive as we add number of plants. And this is a known cost to us. More plants, more pipes, more expensive. But if you have a decentralized system that doesn't have those pumping stations and doesn't have those pipes, it's cheaper. But you have to be able to discharge it in many, many places. So <coughs> federal government and provincial government have provided funding for this project for uh, since about 2010, as it was previously configured. And we can break down the cost of the old project and the new project and show how it's funded. So those were the project costs. $788 million of McLaughlin, the way it was designed. And where we're at right now at the stage of the process is about $1.28 million. That's the 2030 cost. The McLaughlin plan is actually uh, proposed to treat well beyond 2030. It was actually a better deal from that point of view. But we never got to see the whole cost of the system. We only had one bidder at one point give us one cost, and we were never pursued that, so we never know how much it would cost. But that's what the estimate was. So the federal government was going to provide up to $253 million for the whole project, and the provincial government, $248 million. And we would look at our share, 
we can see that we've almost tripled the cost for the CRD taxpayer. And nobody has approved that funding. There's been no vote of the CRD to requisition it. All we've done is approve that $788 million and a $286 million share. So, pipes and pumps. So Rock Bay is the site that is common to all of the option sets, and it's, I don't think it's a very good site. Um, first of all, it's far away from the infrastructure, and that was one of the original criteria for selection. I'm not sure how it actually got selected. It was put forth by City of Victoria at a closed meeting and eventually came to the public. And the criteria that they used isn't available to the public. I can't see all of it in the literature, but it certainly isn't close to the infrastructure. And that should have been a key component. The red dot at the bottom is Clover Point, and this pipe is roughly $200 million. So it begs the question, what can be done to locate a treatment plant near the outfalls, the natural place where it should go. And I had to go and dig up an old document from 2003. And I'll just read from it here. So this was a letter written from Joyce Murray, who was the Minister of Water, Land, and Air Protection in 2003. And it was written to Judy Brownoff, who at the time was the chair of the uh, CRD. And, um, it said, Dear Ms. Brownoff and Directors, I've made a decision on your core area liquid, man liquid waste management plan based on a review of all the information you have presented, a report received from an independent consultant, and reviewed by ministry staff of the LWMP in supporting information. The LWMP does not provide a plan and schedule for the provision of primary and secondary treatment for discharges at Clover Point and Macaulay Point, which is contrary to the direction provided to you by past ministers. So there always was a plan put forth by the ministry to put a plant at Clover Point and Macaulay Point. The natural place is to upgrade from a pumping station to maybe primary treatment or secondary treatment. So what she did is she ordered the CRD to do the following. And it was a long list of about 12 items. Number three, I think, is the most interesting. Immediately commence the pilot testing of treatment technology that will provide primary equivalent treatment for the removal of suspended solids consistent with the municipal sewer regulations. I don't remember anyone doing the pilot or testing any technology. We saw a few things in reports, but it says right here, pilot testing and treatment technology. Wouldn't that be a great way to figure out what works and what can fit in various sites? So that was number three of 17. Four was immediately commence the process to acquire a site for the processing of sludge from future treatment works at Macaulay and Clover Points. So the minister got identified where the treatment plant should have gone. That was going to satisfy the minister. And I think it's a pity that that work wasn't done because it's led us to where we are today, about $60 million in the hole, and seemingly no better off than we were before in 2003. So I dug up another document uh, that was on the CRD news release, and uh, we zoom into the bottom portion here, and I'm just going to enlarge this, and it says, to co-locate co the liquids and biosolids treatment at Burnside, this was a proposed location, and um, what happened at this point in the project is uh, the Viewfield site had been purchased by the CRD and then just dropped on the public as a source for treating the sludge, the biosolids. And Mr. Vanderkirk had come forth through a CRD director and said, I've got a lot of land out of Burnside Road, why don't you put it here instead? So the CRD did a very, very quick analysis on it and they produced this press release to discount it as an option. And they wrote, this would entail, so I go from the beginning, to locate liquids and solids bio treatment, biosolids treatment of Burnside. Sewage currently being discharged at Clover and Collie Point Outfalls would have to be pumped to Burnside Road. This would entail at least two large pump stations and two 1.8 meter diameter pipes to convey the raw sewage to Burnside for treatment and back to the new outfall of McLaughlin Clover Point. So this is the CRD's engineer saying it's very expensive to pipe sewage a long distance. And they're talking about six foot wide pipes, very, very large. When we think about that diagram that I showed with the yellow line, what it's gonna look like is probably something like this. This is a six foot pipe. And if you have a pump station of Macaulay Point sending it to Rock Bay, that would be a smaller three foot pipe that would be half of the system. And then you need a three foot pipe from Clover Point to Rock Bay. And then you need a six foot pipe to get all of that water back to Clover Point to discharge. 
And so in the trench along Cook Street, there would be a three-foot pipe, and there would be this very thick-walled six-foot pipe. And that's, I don't quite know how big the dig would be, but it's got to be dug deep to get under all the surfaces that are already there, all the water lines and gas lines on Cook Street. And then the walls have to be shored with metal so it doesn't cave in on the workers there, and they still get a safe place to work. That's what we're looking at, and that would be $200 million worth of work. So I've been asking the question, should we be selecting the sites and then trying to see what technology we can shoehorn into the sites? Or should we be using the technology to figure out what sites are possible? And I think we've done this two times now. We've gone through two rounds of starting with the sites and some kind of technology that you haven't seen yet. I don't know what it is. There's a representative technology apparently, but I haven't seen it. And now they're calling it a representative design. So they're acknowledging there's still representative technology. So how do you do this? How do you do this? Sandwich Peninsula plant was built in 2000 for about $20 million, and it only serves the cities of Sydney, North Sandwich, and Central Sandwich, and the population is about 30,000. So it would be about a tenth the size, uh, the population is a tenth the size of roughly our population. So the core area is about 300,000 people. If you discount the people in Souk and in Chosen, you discount the people that are on septic systems and have their own treatment plants in their backyard, it's about 300,000. That was built in 2000 for $20 million and another $10 million for pipes and pumps to get it. So it shows in this design, a third of the cost is the pipes and the pumps. So it's $30 million for 30,000 people and $2,000. Why isn't it 30, 300 million for 300,000 people? With some inflation, let's make it 400 million. Why are we being shown these huge costs? It doesn't make sense. At the back of the plant are those two circular concrete pits, and they're called secondary clarifiers. It's the last stage of the treatment process. Some is done in the building, and then it goes into these oxidation ditches, and there's one empty one you see that's being serviced there with a little bit of black. And I'll show you some video of that. It's, there's a final process at the tank, and essentially the treated water is flowing over the top, and the things that aren't wanted are going down to the bottom, and they're being pumped back into the main building. And then it goes through an outfall out into the ocean. So here's a close-up of the tanks, very large concrete. You can see the size of the uh, gantryway there. You know, it's about you know, the width of two people. They're very, very big, and they take up a lot of space. And traditionally, when you've started with this technology, you have to find a lot of land. And all of this land, I think it's about 1.4 hectares, is required just for 30,000 people. So how much land would be required for 300,000 people if you use this technology? Well, quite a lot. And that's why we've ended up a raw thing. There's some kind of technology that's being proposed. It's a relative of this. It's requiring a lot of land. So I started looking around the world for other treatment plants. And I found this very modern looking one in Norway. It looks like an office building. But it's actually a treatment plant. And it's close to the water. Uh, you can see that in the background. And let's see here. We take a look inside the plant. We don't see that kind of technology. We see these boxes. And these boxes are called Salzman's filters. It's a Norwegian invention. And they're about the size of a washer and dryer put together. And that's what it looks like. That's how it's serviced. And you can see an inlet for connecting a pipe on the front. And there'll be another pipe on the side. And there's a motor and there's some other things. And I'm going to show you how this works. And because this is a really great example of how technology has improved and how it can be used to shrink the size of the site. And when you shrink the size of the site, you create a lot more opportunities for where you can site the treatment plants. So this is what's inside the box. I think I've got two to go one more. There we go. So the sewage comes in the inlet at the bottom. And the machine takes the form of an inclined plane and the motor is going to drive the conveyor belt. And up the belt we're going to go with solids and the belt is also porous. This is innovation. And so the water is filtered through the belt as it's running. Over the top and are collected for the, and they uh, are deposited at the back of the machine. And this will rotate around a second to show you how this works. This video just comes off the manufacturer's website and it's, it's been around for about 10 years. There's actually a couple of these links kind of on kind of at the back of the machine is a screw. It, well that's kind of funny. <laughs> And the solids are being compacted and put into a bin, and then those bins will be taken to another facility for processing. These are the residuals 
from this stage of the process <coughs> that could be digested or gasified or something done. But the marvel of the technology is that eight of those boxes replaces those two concrete clarifiers that take up that much space. This is modern technology. Eight of those boxes would cost about $1.6 million. And they just go in and be installed and hooked up and we have to pay someone to do that. And then the belts would last 10 years and we do some maintenance on it. Building those concrete pits, very expensive. A lot more expensive. And they take up a lot more space. So it doesn't seem like we actually have to even have to pay a premium for the compact technology. And that's a big point again. The earlier part of the treatment plant were the oxidation ditches. And the way these work is there's a propeller at each end of the ditch moving the sewage around. And as it does that, it picks up air. It gets blended in with the water. And inside there are bacteria. And what the bacteria do is they eat the sewage and then they burp carbon dioxide. And it's a very basic form of treatment. It's been used for probably 100 years. The form has changed over the years. Sometimes they're covered and sometimes they're open ditches. Someone figured, well, this part of the town, no one's really going to have an issue with the odors, and so we're just going to build it like this. But there was an issue with the odor. And there were many complaints that came from the neighbors, and I think the CRD actually had to buy a few homeowners out. We don't want that to happen with, um, with modern technology. We want the odor free. So there's another piece of technology I'd like to show you, and it's called a vertical reactor. And it's another way to save space. On the right is the clarifier that you saw before, and that gives you an idea of the size of this unit. And it's essentially, it's a deep shaft that's drilled into the ground, and this is my idea of innovation. Instead of having these tanks on the ground taking a lot of space, it's turned to be vertical and drilled down into the ground. And they have these in China, they have them in Canada, they have them in Britain, there's many installations over the world. And there's been some debate at the CRD whether they're effective or not, and it's, it's still up for discussion. The engineering work I've seen, the data I've seen from China, says that they work, and they work on a large scale, not just little ones treating industrial waste in Vancouver or something up in Dawson City. So this is another way we can save space. So first we have that wonderful machine that separates the sludge from the water at that phase. Then for the biological process, for the bacteria that's going to eat the sewage, we have a vertical process that doesn't take much space. So we only really need that tube on the left. And then at the end, to get to the tertiary treatment, we need something like we see at Dockside Green. And this is a photo from a, uh, the Brightwater plant in the United States. But if you go down to Dockside for the tour, you will see one of those uh, cassettes. You'll see a module of it mounted up on the wall. And it's just a very simple technology. It looks like plastic spaghetti. And it's hollow fiber. And the sewage is sucked through it. And all the bad stuff, most of it, stays on the outside. And the water comes through. And then it gets hit with the ultraviolet radiation. And then it goes out into those ponds that Brian showed earlier. So these are three compact technologies to build. Uh, sewage treatment plants. So after I uh, went looking for the above ground sites, I went looking for the below ground sites. And we've seen a proposal for putting something at Windsor Park under the defense course. So I wondered, has this been done? So I came across an engineering company that was in the process of building a sewage treatment plant in Korea. And I started looking at these satellite photos and I was wondering where the plant was. And what I want you to do is I want you to fixate on the green soccer field that's above the plant. And this is a traditional plant. Instead of having these round clarifiers, they have square ones. And instead of having a skimmer that's going around in a circle like you might have seen in the photo, they go back and forth, a bit like um, one of those little manure gates that you see at the farm sometimes, those automatic scrapers that they have for the cows in the barns. And so the blue are these little boxes where the bacteria is doing the work, and you can see the scrapers at the back, and there's some ditches at the front. So this is a satellite photo, and it's not up to date. So I went looking for an up to date photo, and the engineering company sent me this. Again, fixate on the soccer field that's above, because I, we can use those reference points in this next photo. There's a soccer field just below the highway, below that hill, below those buildings. And a lot of the plant has disappeared. And what they're doing is they're replacing an above ground plant with an underground plant. And they're actually reclaiming the land. And the final result is going to be this artist rendition because they hadn't finished at the time I collected these photos. Is a park. <coughs> and we can actually see the work in progress. If you take a look at the right corner, you'll see the service building in white and green. And in this photo, at the end, right where the river and the bridge meet, you can see the service building. They're actually building this. 
This was a large facility that would treat enough sewage for the whole of Greater Victoria, the core area, and this cost $100 million a few years ago. That was the budget. That's what was requisitioned. That's what they started to build. But it shows how the, shows how the technology has advanced to the point where you don't even need to have it above ground anymore. You need a building to access it of some kind and get things in and out. You might have a crane to lower one of those membranes up and down like we saw in the previous photo. But you can actually reuse the land. So think about that. The technology is allowing you to pick a place you wouldn't normally pick and turn it back into what it was before or even better. And I think that is a wonderful advancement. And we haven't seen this from the CRD. We've seen some presentations done by architects on how this can be done. And I was able to get this photo into the slideshow for the architects. But it doesn't seem to have caught fire with, with uh, the directors and the engineers yet, largely because they haven't been attending these meetings. So about three, four weeks ago, uh, something wonderful happened at the CRD. There was an item on the agenda of the sewage committee, and it was a proposal that was put in by a company called Capital Clear. McLaughlin Prior